There's a passage where the Buddha compares the practice to a fortress on the frontier. The foundation post for the fortress is conviction that the Buddha really did gain awakening. And there are lessons to be learned from his awakening. It's not just one event that happened to happen in the course of human history. It's one of those events that defines the possibilities of life. It is possible to find a deathless happiness. I know some people say, well, we as human beings are just conditioned. Basically, we're just our bodies with brains that somehow have consciousness. But that's getting things backwards. As the Buddha said, if you define yourself, you limit yourself. Instead, the Buddha tried to find out okay, what is skillful. In other words, what are the potentials of human action? How skillful can you get? And he found that it is possible to find a way that leads to something unfabricated. The same with that. A road leads to a mountain. The road doesn't cause the mountain, but it gets you there. So we're convinced of that. We're also convinced of what he learned about what life is like if you don't follow this path. It just goes around and around and around. As he said, it's like throwing a stick up into the air. Sometimes it lands on this end, sometimes on that end, sometimes splat in the middle. You'd never really arrive anywhere. He called it samsara, which means wandering on. That's all it is, just beings wandering, wandering around. Or someone up in Canada said, bumbling our way through life. And so we see that, we realize we've got to practice to get out. And it is possible to get out. So that's our foundation post. Then there's a moat and an encircling road around the walls. That's your sense of shame and sense of compunction. Shame, of course, being the opposite of shamelessness. You realize there are awakened beings and you want to look good in their eyes. You'd be ashamed to do anything that they would criticize. As for compunction, that has nothing to do with anyone else. It's simply you realize yourself that if you act in unskillful ways, you're going to suffer. Then you have wisdom as a wall, discernment as a wall, and it's plastered over so there are no handholds, so the enemy can't climb up the wall to get in. You've got mindfulness as the gatekeeper. He recognizes who is a friend and who is a foe. He lets in only the friends. In other words, your mindfulness has to be discerning. It doesn't just accept whatever comes in. It's very particular about where the mind should be focused, what it should not be focused on, and what kind of qualities it should develop. So you let those good qualities in. And then inside you've got soldiers. The soldiers are your right effort. If any unskillful qualities do get into the fortress, they chase them out. They try to encourage skillful qualities to stay and to develop. And they have weapons. You're learning what you've learned about the Dharma through Dharma talks, through readings, things to remind you what you really should be doing. Now the soldiers in the mindfulness need food. That's where concentration comes in. This helps you see the role of concentration. The Buddha compares the different levels of jhana to different kinds of food. And the soldiers in his fortress are pretty well fed. They get ghee and honey and butter. Things that were, back in those days were considered delicacies. And also very nourishing. Because in order to fight the defilements as they come up, you need to be nourished. Without the nourishment, the practice gets very dry. So when you have a question of how to balance the pleasure of concentration with the need for strong effort in the practice. Think of this analogy of the fortress. You're basically a soldier, and the soldier needs to be fed. There's Napoleon who says that an army marches on its stomach. 
And one of the reasons why he was such a successful general is because he kept his soldiers well fed. The same way you have to keep feeding your mind. Because if the mind doesn't have concentration to feed on, it's going to go feeding someplace else. Either on sensual pleasures, or if you take pride in denying yourself of any pleasures, it's going to feed on that. Which is not necessarily a healthy thing to feed on. Remember the customs of the noble ones, where you are content with your material surroundings. As long as it's good enough to practice, it's good enough. But you don't exalt yourself and disparage others or the fact that you can be content about having just a little where other people seem to be indulging in more pleasure. The Buddha encouraged you to find pleasure in your concentration so you don't go feeding around on these unskillful attitudes. But remember, the purpose of the feeding is not just to sit around and eat and then go to sleep. You feed and because you have work to do. Similar to the Buddha's reasons for focusing on the present moment. It's not that often in the canon that he focuses on how we should be alert to the present moment. Given all the attention that's given to the present moment in modern meditation circles, it's strange to note that how rarely the Buddha does mention the topic, but when he does mention it, it's in the context of mindfulness of death. So we're not here because the present moment is a wonderful moment, or it's the only thing you've got, so you might as well learn how to enjoy it. He's saying it's where the work is to be done. You know you're going to die at some point. It could come at any time. Death comes without a, a warning sign. Just like that volcano that erupted the other day down in Chile. No earthquakes, no sign. All of a sudden, bang! 17,000 feet into the air. Well, death can be like that. And so are you ready to go? And that large part of the mind will say, no, not yet, not yet. Well, why not? What are you attached to? What unskillful attitudes in the mind would make it difficult for you to go? You've got to work on those right now. So you have to have a sense of urgency. But this is not work to be rushed. It is meticulous work. You're trying to figure out what the mind is doing, and the mind is doing subtle things. Well, too often we're aware of defilements only when they're full-blown. We know only overcoming anger or overcoming lust. But we have to learn to see the warning signs that they're about to come. And you do that by focusing strong attention on the present moment and looking for what's happening. Now you need to sustain yourself here, and that's what the concentration is for. And the concentration is also so that you can see. If your mind isn't steady, whatever you see is going to be blurry. It's like doing a scientific experiment with your equipment placed on a table that wobbles. No matter what it measures, the measurements will be unreliable because the foundation is not solid. It's not still. So the stillness is there both as nourishment and also to allow you to see. This is why the pleasure of concentration is different from the pleasure of sensuality. Sensuality makes it hard to see things clearly. Because a lot of sensuality lies in how you dress things up to yourself in your imagination. It's a lot of make-believe. That's where the pleasure comes in sensuality. The pleasure in concentration is something else. You do have to learn how to appreciate it. The Buddha compares it to having a wild elephant. They would take the wild elephant, bring it into the city, and tie it to a strong post. And at first the elephant would resist everything, but they would do what they could to make the elephant feel good being there. They would sing songs to it. They'd even play the flute. They'd treat it gently. They'd speak to it well. The vocabulary of an elephant trainer 
is really interesting. What do you call the elephant? Deer. Like deer elephant, sir elephant. And if the message finally got through that the people wanted to be good to the elephant, despite the fact that they had him tied down, there would come a point where the elephant would finally eat. When the elephant started to eat, then they would know, okay, now he's going to survive. He's trainable. In the same way, you have to learn how to appreciate the, the sense of well-being that comes with concentration. It's an acquired taste. But once you acquire that taste, it really gets addictive. And it's a good addiction to have, because otherwise, as I said, you'll go back to your other old, unskillful ways of looking for pleasure. But here again, you feed the elephant because you want work out of it. So think of the concentration as food, nourishment, in addition to giving the mind a steady place to do its work. You're keeping it energized so that work can continue, because just as you don't know how soon death is going to come, you don't know how long the practice is going to take. For some people the practice is pleasant and fast, for some it's pleasant and slow. For some it's going to be painful and fast, and some it's going to be painful and slow. And it's not the case that you can order which one you want. It's not like a menu in a restaurant. You have to figure out what kind of practice yours is by seeing what works. But even in cases where it's painful, you still have to have some sense of pleasure to keep you going, and that's what the concentration is for. The pain comes in having to contemplate the body an awful lot, or contemplate food an awful lot, because you've got a lot of attachments to lust, a lot of attachments to greed, a lot of attachment to sensual pleasures. But you also need concentration to keep you going. When time comes for the mind to rest, you really let it rest. Jamma Habu makes a comparison. He says, there are times when you're working and the work needs to get done. But you realize that if you don't stop to eat, you're going to run out of strength. So even though you could have worked during your lunch hour, you don't. You take your lunch, you rest, for the sake of the work. When you can keep these images in mind, then it's a lot easier to figure out how to find contentment in the concentration, but also how not to get stuck in the concentration. We hear so much about the dangers of concentration. The Buddha talks about them occasionally, not much. Here in the West it's common, that, especially in Vipassana places, they'll tell you about concentration and the next thing you know they'll tell you about the dangers of concentration. Well, that wasn't the Buddha's way. He talked about concentration, he talked about it in, in attractive ways. The images he gives, the cool water permeating a lake, lotuses saturated with water, an awareness that fills the body, surrounds the body in the same way that a white cloth might surround your body. They're attractive images, and they're meant to be attractive. So that you want to try this to develop this ability to find pleasure here as you breathe in, as you breathe out, and the mind can settle down. When the Buddha does talk about the dangers of concentration, they're simply that you might get stuck here and not move on to the next step, which is to try to develop discernment. But that danger is minor to the dangers of not having concentration. The people who practice and practice and practice and burn out, or the people get really good at labeling their mental states, but then get very sloppy about giving in to unskillful mental states when they're not doing formal practice. So feed yourself so you can work. Feed yourself well. After all, the Buddha says it's like honey, ghee, butter, rich food for the mind. 
food that gives you the nourishment you need for the work that has to be done.